Welcome to Vinyl Junkies, this error-free episode of Vinyl 101, the art of crate digging. Hope you guys are doing well. Uh, we like collecting records, don't we? There's a difference that happens between um, buying them online and actually going to the store and digging through dusty crates, right? And I would argue that... Um, the difference is that the dusty crates, what makes that the elements that make that such a special thing is the same elements as to why we listen to music on vinyl. That's to say that we employ the rest of our senses. Okay, so uh, it's not just music. We take it, we play with it, we put it on the turntable, the whole rest of it. The same thing when it comes to digging through crates. You just kind of... The, the anticipation of not knowing what you're going to get next is a huge thing. So what it is that I thought is I'd put together an episode and share some of my tips with you. If you uh, want, please share your tips with us. And one of you might actually win a record. Uh, there's a companion piece to this. If you visit our website at vinyljunkies.co, uh, there's a written piece that kind of goes into detail. I'll probably share some tips on the show that I don't have on uh, the article. So they're kind of companion pieces. What it is that I encourage all of you guys to do is be a part of the community. Share your tips with us, man. Uh, you know, you guys have been doing it a long time to, uh, also. And collectively, well, you know, uh, it's good to be able to just uh, help each other out. Um, okay, so where do we start? You know what? Why don't I start with this really schnazzy original uh, intro that I did for the thing? The way it is that I started the article is, Crate digging is an art unto itself. To me... Flipping through dusty record bins is a treasure hunt for something personally meaningful. The record store is the excavation site. The records are the artifacts that tell the story. Expressed in basic terms, it's musical archaeology. It's uh, cultural anthropology. Um, the fact that we're kind of like getting involved is what makes the difference. So, let's talk about this ritual a little bit. Um... First of all, do you guys have a preference? I know that a lot of you, uh, you know, you live out where there's not a lot of record stores. So there's, uh, you know, collecting and buying records online is an absolute reality and there's nothing wrong with it. But, you know, for those of you that uh, actually uh, shop at record stores that you're lucky enough, you got enough, you know, you got more than one around type of thing. What is it that makes the difference between the shop that you visit very often and the shop that you don't go see very often, other than the stock. Obviously, stock is one thing, and yes, price is another thing. I'm going to go into all of it, but uh, you guys add yours. If I see your comments, I'm going to uh, play along and kind of talk to you as well. Uh, let's see, where do we start? Okay, used versus new records. The first thing that I would say about used versus new records uh, is just basically ask the question, which you guys should answer for me. Uh, if you're buying new records at uh, even an independent record shop, is it still considered crate digging? My answer is this. I would say yes and no. Okay, I'll explain myself. You feel free to disagree. Feel free to add to the conversation. That's the idea. Okay, where it is that I'll say no, since that's the... Actually, where it is that I'll say yes, it's crate digging is probably a lot easier. Okay, we can't take for granted that everybody just goes to the record store all the time. Sometimes people just go, what, once a year, a couple of times a year, only when they travel. You don't know. So if somebody doesn't have that habit of actually going and visit the stores on a regular basis, everything is crate digging. Everything, even the new stuff. Okay. Where I would argue that it's not crate digging when you're playing with the new stuff is when you're dealing with nerds like me. And the fact is, is that there's a ton of nerds out there and you all do the same thing, right? What it is that we do is we read all the news, we check out our favorite bands, we know when the vinyl releases are coming out. Those of us that like the multiple copy type of thing know which variants are sold where, you know the street date, and we all know what day do records come out on. Generally speaking, on Fridays. Always Fridays, right? So... If we already know all this information beforehand and all you're doing is going to the record store to go pick up a record that you know is going to be there or you even reserved, listen, I'd argue that that's not crate digging because you already know. You've taken some elements out of it. The element of surprise is definitely uh, a very big part of it. It can't be treasure if you already know that you're going to dig it up, right? So 
that would be the argument between the two of them. Um, is there a preference? No, I don't think that there's a preference at all. Some people really do like the new recordings and prefer them. Um, other people swear by uh, used records, especially when they're originals. I would not say personally that there's a, you know, it's a preference thing. Having a scratchy old original, this is where it's important to kind of know what to look for when you're crate digging. Every label and every period uh, has its uh, strengths and weaknesses, okay? So, for example, the uh, example that I gave in the article is, let's say uh, you're digging up a record from the late 60s versus digging up a record from the 80s, for example. There is a very big difference, okay? The records for the 60s, for whatever reason, um, were just built to last, especially when you look at those kind of pickup uh, record players that used to exist. Those those styluses were were nails were basically nails and they still played through them incredibly you listen to some of those old original james brown and aretha franklin records and even though they're all scratched up they still sound good uh not always but after a while you can tell when there's a deep scratch and when it's just a surface scratch to get into that um look actually right from the very beginning before we even get into scratches First thing, let's say, let's talk about new records, okay? New records and used records There's one thing I think you should always do, and I learned uh, from experience. I didn't follow my own experience this weekend, but uh, visited three stores, by the way, uh, for this report. I mean, I've done this my whole life, but I figured I'd visit three different shops to kind of just, you know, get the feel and kind of like get that experience before I do the show. But um, one thing that I learned immediately, uh, and I didn't follow my own advice is always check your records always check condition and yes even new unfortunately uh this weekend made it so that i came across three uh three faulty records from three different record companies brand new i broke the seal on the damn thing and they were still not good they were warped they didn't play well uh one of them unfortunately is this uh, box set here the Otaker box set 12 records it's amazing right i was very excited to get it i mean and you're supposed to get excited right these are high ticket items if you just look right from there you can already kind of see you see you can already see that it's kind of like facing upwards a little bit if you go in most of the records are warped uh so there's a quality control issue that um is getting better but uh buyer beware why do I say that? Because, well, when you go to a store, an independent store, look, first of all, it's not the independent workshop. Let's just be clear. Um, they work really, really hard for what they do. And they're, look, they're not, people that love music aren't doing it because they love money. Okay, that's not really the case. People that work at record shops generally love music themselves and they're only too glad to help you out with this stuff. But the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of these indies uh, can't return the stuff. So it's happened to me in the past where you can't return something. You can get store credit. You don't want to get caught in that whole rigmarole. So just open the record up right there before you leave and make sure. In terms of the listening to it, uh, same thing. You know, you should probably give it a quick listen. In terms of used, it's a different thing. Uh, you should definitely always uh, check out your used records. And there are things that, uh, you know, you can look at that uh, will tell you uh, whether you're dealing with, you know, a record that's very old or might have trouble or not. I'll try to point some of those out once I find them. Give me one second. I'm going to get myself a record to show you here. Actually, you know what? Why don't we use this fabulous record from Alan Stivell? It's actually not that fabulous, but I will talk about Alan Stivell anyway. Uh, why did I buy it? I think it's pretty obvious, right? Never, ever, ever uh, just go past the cheapy crate because you think you're not going to find records. You'd be surprised at the amazing stuff you'll find. Um, this one, not so amazing, but that cover, the price was right. It was in the $3 box. I had to find out, right? There wasn't a turntable there, so I took a chance. No problem. Where it is that I won for the same thing, right? Same box. This one was $2. Folks, Stanley Tarantine. Doesn't matter. I never heard it. It's fantastic. I already know that it's going to be fantastic. All this is to say that don't uh, pass by the cheapies boxes. Uh, one man's trash is another man's treasure. And there's also the very, very simple premise that 
nobody knows all records. It's impossible. Some record labels, I mean, sorry, some record stores have their specialty, but we can't know it all. So there is always the chance to just really find something that'll blow you away. It's happened to me many times. I'm sure it's happened to a lot of you guys. Keep doing it. You know, does it require patience? Yeah, does it, it does. Does it require you to get down on your knees and get all uncomfortable and look at the shit boxes? Yeah, that's possible also. But it's worth it. It's it nabbed me that St uh, Stanley Turrentine record, so I'm very happy. Stanley Turrentine, very very good. Alan Stavell. We're gonna have to see, but there are things that you can see. Okay, uh, first of all. Um, I guess we can talk about the actual record stores. Um, you can tell a lot about a record store, the record shop that you're visiting by the way they handle their own stock. Okay, so, uh, I mean, if you go into some record stores and you just see piles on top of each other, just big piles, uh, these people don't care about their records, but we see that often, right? Um, if you see, uh, just records scattered everywhere or no order to them other than the new arrivals, of course, you know, it kind of tells you how it is that they're doing their business. Um, one thing that I would argue, and I will say it with the caveat that I would probably say most record stores don't do this, but it's something that I would most certainly suggest, at least for records that are whatever, man, find whatever amount you think is right you know let's say ten dollars and up records type of thing but a lot of these records you know they come in these browned sleeves and if a record store i'm it, what it is that i'm saying is that the record stores that you notice take the time to give you a proper outer sleeve on your record and pro pro a proper inner sleeve even better Okay. And if they go the extra step of actually taking the time to clean their record, you're talking about a record store that cares about its stock and makes sure that uh, they're giving you, you know, they're presenting it to you properly. They understand that some of those records cost a lot of money and they're giving you that. If you just got it in a cardboard box with a hundred dollar sticker on it, you got, anyway, you understand what I'm saying? Okay. So that's number one. Basically, you can see, you can kind of get the, you, you, you get a feel for what type of digs you have, okay? The thing is, is that don't, absolutely don't discard the, um, well, depending on the price, we will get the price. Don't discard the place that just has stacks everywhere because that usually means that they didn't even bother taking the time to look through all of that. So you'd be amazed at some of the good stuff that you find in just complete junk shops. Uh, in other words, you know what? Let your curiosity guide you and let this disease that we have just... Fuck, might as, have, might as well just have fun with it. You never come home with something that's not worth happening. All music is awesome, Okay. Should we go to price? Is it too early to go to price? How are we doing so far? I accept, I expect excellence from all new records. There is no excuse. There you go. Uh, without a question. Um, one thing that's frustrating about the new record thing is that, well, look, you know, now I got to return it. And like I said, returning stuff can be trouble. Um, but, you know, considering that I think crate digging for the most part is a used uh, you know, it's more for used stuff. I think, to me, that's probably where we should focus most of our attention. Um, new records. Okay. This is where it is that I'll end on new records. Generally speaking, I'm reading straight from the article, which you can check out yourself on vinyljunkies.co. Uh, thanks for subscribing, by the way. New records. Generally speaking, you get what you pay for without much wiggle room. While the general quality control around vinyl record production seems to have improved, there are still far too many subpar records being sold. It is still not uncommon to crack the seal on a new record only to find a slab that's warped, has surface defects, noise, pops, clicks, fingerprints. Uh, it happens to me three times uh, during just the dig of la a couple of days ago. So it happens. It happens. Can you get a refund? We went through that. Likely not. Can it be returned or replaced? Look, man, don't blame the indies. Don't blame the indies. It's a fucked up system. It's just sometimes they can't. 
uh, but you get stuck with it. Store credit is very often something cool, and if you bought your records in some, you know, somewhere where they have a lot of stock, store credit is cool, man. You're happy. You know, you'll find something else. That's very cool. Um, in any case, defective records are an irritant which simply shouldn't exist. Would you accept? This is the example I always give. Would you accept a car, brand new car, beautiful, runs like a dream? The air conditioning rattles, right? Doesn't work. No. You don't need the air conditioning not to rattle in order for the car to drive. Luxury, but you're selling a fucked up car. So that's the deal. Used records. Okay, look, uh, I would say one of the reasons that I argue uh, for used records is because immediately, because the record is used, it's not better or not. Sometimes it's much better to have the reissue. I will get to that, but... Uh, the deal with used records is it has something immediate. It has history. It has mojo. Uh, for those of you that believe mojo, I do. You know, want to give you an example? How about this? Um, you know, think about it. Whenever you're given records from somebody who passed, especially if those records uh, belonged to somebody who really had passion for the music and took care of them, you're not just getting a bunch of old records. What it is that you're doing is you're getting their mojo, man. You're getting your, you're, you're, you're keeping that alive. I think that these records, because of their physicality and their history, have a living, breathing element to it. It just, it just makes everything better for me. So I would say that, yes, you know, uh, nothing beats the feeling of having an original pressing of a record. They're often actually also the best sounding records especially when you're talking about the old stuff because the old stuff was all analog from beginning to the end so if you get yourself a record that's in great condition okay and we've already gone over the fact that a lot of records from those old days 60s earlier especially even with scratches they still sound amazing but those records were built to last and they're great so yes they are worth going after the thing is, is that sometimes that's not the case okay firstly if the record scratched the shit what's the point Okay. Uh, and secondly, uh, there simply may, may not be that many of those original pressings. So, um, you know, the example that I give is, I mean, I would love to find an original mono copy of uh, John Coltrane, a love, uh, not a Love Supreme, but my favorite things. Chances are I'm not going to get it because, well, the master tapes to those mono recordings doesn't exist anymore. So they can't make reissues. If you'll notice, all the reissues of my favorite things are all stereo for that reason. So, of course, I'd like that, but uh, I'm not holding my breath. Now, if you're the type of collector to go on Discogs and do that, or when it shows up at the record store, pay the price that they're asking, that's fine. To each his own. Enjoy your records. It's your business. Okay. In terms of value... Look, it's pretty simple. Uh, we can argue, um, well, I'll make two arguments, okay? I'll make the general argument, and then I'll at least, what I'll do is I'll share uh, my parameters. I'll share how it is that I, um, how it is that I consider pricing when it is that I go shopping for used records. On new records, I don't consider that at all because I think that you should give, especially the independent record stores, a complete break on that, Okay. They buy them from the distributor. They cost so much, they add their margin. They're not making a lot of money on that stuff. They're making money on the used stock, okay? And they're constantly looking for the used stock. So that's where it is that the value is. That's where the gold is. That's also where it is that you get hosed sometimes if you deal with people who uh, are just looking to uh, extract as much as possible. So it all depends. The thing is, is that I can't change their standards, but I know what my standards are. And when I go visit a record store, I go with those standards. I adopt them and I will share them with you. You guys, why don't you tell me? Actually, you know what? I want to know your standards and I'd love to know if you agree with me or if you don't agree with me. Um, should we talk about work? No. You know what? Let's talk about the standard. Um, okay, like I said, when, I talk, when we're talking about price, uh, new records don't come into the picture. When it comes to old records, what it is that I do is, uh, look, Discogs is your friend. It's, there are other, you know, there's Pop Psych out there where you can see the history of auctions on any particular record, but Discogs, up to date, and probably it'll continue to be there, is the most complete record database that measures 
uh, that not only compiles all the records, but it measures the history of how that record sold. So if you take a look at some records, and I will use this Frank Zappa record actually as an example, which I just bought. Okay, so I bought it because, well, I wanted it. I didn't look through anything in this particular case. I just picked it up, right? So the price is $21.99. Now, if you go look for this record, this particular pressing on Discogs, you're going to see that there's a section that has minimum price, median price, and maximum price. And they tell you the last time that it's sold. Why is that important? Because if you want to know how your store is pricing your stuff, what you do is you look at the median, okay? Minimum and maximum price, very often you're going to see enormous differences because people are so fucking whacked out about trying to get as much money as possible. The prices of this stuff are going crazy. So what you want to know is you can't do anything about the market, but what you want to know is where does your record sta store stand? And you can do that. It's pretty simple. Once you take your records and you place them in the database of Discogs, after about a dozen entries... You start seeing a pattern. You see, now what I do is I use the comments section of every Discogs entry and I put how much I paid for the record and I put where I got the records from. Okay, so I'm able to track after a while how much. So when I take a look at this record, the minimum on this record was about $3.50. The maximum was about $36. The reason it is on Discogs, the reason it is that I point that out is just to show you how insane it can get. Okay, again, you can't do anything about that. What it is that you can do, however, and for me, honestly, it's the only measuring stick that I've come up with that makes any sense is you look at median because median basically tells you what's right in the middle. So if this record, for example, was sold 25 times on Discogs, what's the price right in the middle of that? What's the median price? Okay, so when I took a look and the median price on this was $15.50 US, I paid $21.99 Canadian. I got median price. After going to the store and checking it out with a couple of more releases, I noticed that it's exactly that. They price around the median. So that tells me that they're fair. They're not trying to hose you. Okay. Um, how about the places that price below median? Uh, those don't really exist. <laughs> because if they existed... It's because, look, they don't know what they're doing, okay? So that's to say they don't know what they have. But generally speaking, anybody who works in records does use Discogs as a database, and if they're telling you that they don't, they're lying to you. Because if you notice, they don't say, you know, they don't, but the prices are always higher, not lower. So what it is that they're doing is they're trying to justify, I, I, I don't use Discogs. Bullshit. And you should use Discogs because you don't blame the tool. It's a good tool. It's important. Okay. What happens when you got the stores that price over median? That happens all the time. Um, after a while, you start spotting it. Like I said, a dozen, uh, you buy a dozen records from a store, you start seeing the ones that really jack their prices and which ones don't. Now, in some cases, you have to accept that because there's some stores that specialize, right? So in other words, if you go to a record store that specializes mostly in metal, look... There's a premium, perhaps, that you have to pay for walking into that metal shop because you know that it's highly likely that you'll find the stuff there. Maybe you can argue that. Maybe. Or maybe they're just, just trying to hose you. I don't know. That you're going to have to depend yourself. Uh, you're going to have to depend on uh, for yourself. But all this is to say that it's not right or wrong. But for me, I look at the median price in Discogs and I see whether the price is above or below. I look at what the prices are being sold for right now. And I do it after the fact for the most part, okay? So I go home and it's like, because I'm not going to bitch in the store. Give me the thing. No problem. I'll buy it. But you know what? If I notice that your prices are 50% above the median every single time, I'm going to stop coming to your store. I just am. No matter how wonderful your records are. I realize that if you don't have a lot of record stores in your place, you don't have a choice. So you're fucked. So geography does have a good thing. Also, it should be said that... Um, it is not the only measurement that matters at all. Uh, again, we can point to geography. There are some areas where, uh, you know, if you want good country music on the Star Day label, you're going to find it a lot more in the Rust Belt and down in Nashville and areas where country music, American country music, is more prevalent. Okay, You might not find as much of it up here. Okay, so that should be taken into account. You know, if you go to L.A., there's a lot of the CTI stuff and there's... The, 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 every area has 
records that are a little bit more bountiful. Here in Montreal, if you want a Godspeed record, you know, just open your window and yell out the window, I need a Godspeed vinyl! You're gonna find one, I promise. Even the ones with the little crushed penny, all of them, they're, they're, they're here, they're here. Okay, so that counts also. Geography does absolutely count. Uh, while I was talking up how wonderful this record is, there's one thing that's not cool. Um, in the used uh, category, again, here, always, absolutely always check your records. Always. Uh, because if you don't, it's on you. Okay. Look for warps. Uh, warps are immediate and you spot them. Okay, now those warps can affect play, and if they're bad enough, they can actually damage your record also. I believe I have a John Lee Hooker record here where I can show you that. Give me one second. Here it is. All right, so check. Podcast land can't see it, but this John Lee Hooker record, for example. Okay, beautiful. I mean, who wouldn't want it? But the thing is, is that what it is, is a Frisbee. I've had this for a while. This isn't what I picked up at the, during the store, but it does show immediately, though. Okay. If you take a look at the record, you can't really see it online, but the record has a warp. Actually, even more, it has a lip. A lip is what happens when you have the warp right around the edge. Okay, that very, very often happens when records have been left in the sun too long, so they start melting down from one side. I'm trying to find it here. Hey, here you go. Right here, okay? Let's see if we can catch it in the camera. Probably not. But there's a lip there, okay? What happens is that the needle jumps every time you go over that. That's not good for your tone arm. It's not good for your stylus. And the record simply doesn't play right. So those you should avoid at all costs. You're bringing home a Frisbee, no matter how good the record is. Even if it is a, a, a bitchin' John Lee Hooker record, it's a Frisbee, okay? Uh, when it is that you have a slight warp, that's not the hugest deal because there are ways to kind of fix that with clamps and weights. That's another show for another time, okay? But if you see significant warp, keep that away. A record is supposed to stay flat. A record's supposed to play on a level surface. And uh, if it's not doing that, it will affect play. It'll cause distortion. It'll mess up the alignment on your arm. A bunch of things. Not really worth it, okay? Uh, but, again, the feeling of getting a used record, right? You find a used mono record of whatever you like or just a, 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 an original Slayer pressing of Haunting the Chapel is going to get you excited, you know? Your titties explode a little bit. You get excited. I understand this, okay? But uh, if it's all warped, no good. No good. There's also something else that you need to take into consideration when we start getting really precious about how originals are so much better. Folks, used records are great. I love them. I prefer them, as a matter of fact. But used records also means that you don't know the person who played them before. You don't know how often. You don't know under which sounds. You don't know. You just don't know. So these records may have groove damage. I don't have one where I can show you, but if you check groove damage, there's a couple of ways that you can see if a record's been played a whole lot. Okay, let me see if I can show you this. Let's use this Jethro Tull record that I just picked up. I'll put my fingers on it, but uh, I do clean all my records. Okay, so look, if you take a look at this, okay, uh, one thing that you should do is just look really, really close at the spindle. You see how the spindle is clean? There's no little scratches or anything like that. There's no indentations. The spindle, which is this part here, the middle part, okay, basically that tells you that this record was either not played very often or it was well taken care of by the person who played it. Usually, if you see the spindle on a used record that's all destroyed, the paper's a little torn up, or you just see that you know it's just marked up type of thing, it's because it's gotten a lot of plays and... Uh, you should check that out. That said, most independent stores have listening stations. The good ones should. They should all have listening stations because you're buying a used record. It's important to know, right? Uh, and if they don't have listening stations, you know, if you have a relationship with the person at the store and uh, 
you know, they understand. They're there to sell records. They're there, you know, they're, it's about sharing the music. Ask them to play it on the store stereo if you don't think that it's a bother, you know. It gives you an opportunity to strike up a conversation about that Stevie Wonder record you want to take home, right? You're not sure. This Inner Visions, it's really nice. It's an original 73 Inner Visions or talking book, you know, with the Braille sign up on top. I really want to take this home, but I'm not sure if it's any good. The spindle looks a little messed up. I don't know. Those early records, the best way is trust your ears. Take the record, play it. If it's good, take it home. Okay. Um... And the second thing is, uh, besides using kind of like your own census test, is like I said, you know, uh, pricing. People are allowed to price things however they want. Uh, something is worth whatever somebody wants to sell it for or whatever somebody is willing to pay for it. So there's no right answer. On the other hand, there's nothing that stops you from going in with your own bar barometer. My personal barometer is Discogs Median. Uh, and if you stay at the median, I'm happy. And if you go above the median, then I know. And, uh, when I come to your shop, then I know that that's how you do things. Irritant, absolute irritant. This same record that's been happy and I'm swell, uh, with, I haven't listened to it yet. Um, the reason is there are other records to listen to, but there's actually one specific reason why I didn't play this yesterday when I wanted to see it's sealed completely tight you can't open this okay now it wouldn't be a problem if it was easy to open but it's not there's fucking tape all over the place why is this a problem you're a lot okay i understand this to prevent theft and you don't want people you know there's some stores that don't want you handling the records too much it depends okay i got that but the thing is that you see this even when i take it home removing all the tape is so bothersome that i might destroy my cover doing it so here you are you're trying to protect your record but you're making it inconvenient for me as a client okay i gotta take a scissor and cut very carefully why uh this happened also at amoeba i can't say that i'm all for that uh i think that when you're selling used records everyone should have uh the right to inspect the goods uh so don't make it so hard because when you tell you when you bring it home I got to cut that open and it's a pain in the ass and I don't want to have to take my record home that I just bought and destroy it. Why? Because of that. So I think that's probably all I would say about that. Scratches, scratches, scratches. I should probably read some of your comments. No, I'm not giving you my Zappa record, Andrew Earl. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Okay. Why don't we talk about cleanliness? Uh, because another thing, right? Standards. It's just... The chances are, if you're dealing with uh, an independent store that takes the time to wash their records, clean their records, you're dealing with people who are taking care of it. Like I said, the vast majority of people don't do that. That's not necessarily a bad thing. However, you do go into record stores where you can see that they're not even visually graded. And visually graded means they don't even bother looking at them. Okay, And that does that you spot. You spot that really the garbage shops are okay if they're selling it for garbage prices. But when it is that they're putting it out as garbage and pricing it over median according to Discogs, fuck those stores. Fuck them. And they exist. They do. You grab the record. You open it up. Whatever the price is on it, $5.99, $6.99, it doesn't matter if you were happy with it. Open the record up. There's a scratch all the way through it. What that tells you is that there's no standard and they'll sell it to you anyway or they didn't inspect their own material they took the record and they put a price tag on it according to whatever parameters they follow but they did not inspect the product i think it's important to know that when you visit your record store if that's happening you should at least know that that's happening some stores do that some stores don't do that Go to the stores that do. They go the extra mile and they work hard to earn uh, your business. And your business should be earned. So I think that the good record stores should be supported for that. If they're going those few extra steps, uh, it should be noted. Because they don't have to and not everybody does it. As a matter of fact, uh, almost nobody does it. I think it's really cool when they do. Okay, Especially when they got the extra new sleeves. That's really amazing. I love it. 
Holy smokes, are we are we really already at random tips? Nah. Used versus new. Share this, by the way. I'd really... I'm going to probably go into your comments and um, read your comments, see what you have to say. That's how we're going to end. Conditions. Yeah, okay, we went over all of that. Okay. I'm going to go through random tips now. Um, don't make any assumptions as to the cheap boxes or the not cheap boxes. Like I said... Nobody can know everything when it comes to buying records. It's impossible to know all the records, no longer, no matter how long you've been doing it. That's to say that there are stores that have their area of specialty, like I mentioned, okay? That also means that it's a good thing if you're going for that specialty, because you're more likely to find it. It's a really good thing, because sometimes those are the shops that don't, pay much attention to the stuff that they don't care about it happens okay so finding an original copy of ride the lightning for five dollars in a store that sold mostly um r&b and soul and some jazz that's a beautiful thing what it is that it tells me is that the owner of the shop doesn't give a shit enough about metal to put anything on it so he just slapped the price on it to my benefit right so there are good things and bad things about the specialty shops if you like more than just one genre of music, it can be a really good thing because you'll find those, you know, African records or you'll find those old blues records maybe in a metal shop where, you know, they don't really care about it so much. All this is to say that there are surprises, there are secrets everywhere, and the entire pleasure of collecting records is really just digging up that treasure. Uh, digging where you least expect it that's the good stuff, man. That's what makes the story even better. Um, pretty obvious, I think. If I wouldn't be surprised if all of you uh, mentioned this, but probably the best place to start at a record store is the New Arrivals. New Arrivals is fresh stock. Record stores that see a lot of volume and buy a lot of records go through fresh stock all the time. You want that. Because you're getting first pick of those records that may mean that you're not going to get the best price because some of the records that sit in the bins for a little while what happens is they know these records have been sitting around in their bins a while and they'll lower the price on them to get rid of them and make more space so there's an advantage there too but generally speaking definitely the case if it's a record store that you visit very often what you do is look at the new arrivals first that's the fresh stock go for it and uh, when you're digging out your records don't if it's a maybe take it with you okay excuse me so what i mean by that i'll just have a drink okay hope you guys are enjoying the show so far if you are sure you know okay so where was i um where was i where, where was i yeah the new arrivals uh, that's probably not where it is that you're going to get the deal because first come, first serve. So, I mean, I think rightfully so, you know, they're going to try to, if they have a gem, they're going to want to get what they can for it as long as they're fair. Again, what's fair depends on the person. I've told you how it is that I measure it for myself. Okay. But, um, that's if it's a store that you go visit regularly because after a while, you know, all their back stock. Now, if it's a store that you don't visit regularly, you should definitely go look in the back stock. Look at the bins that have been there because you don't know the store. You don't know what they value. You don't know what their clientele is. You don't know what their area of specialty is. You don't know a bunch of things because you're not familiar with the store. So sometimes that's where it is that you're going to find the gold. For example, I went to LA and love, I, I'm a massive fan of CTI records. And I went to LA very specifically to buy CTI records. And found a whole bunch of them very, very, very cheaply priced because they are plentiful. They are everywhere. So you're going to get the $2 Diodato records and, you know, the $3 Ron Carter records and so forth. It's possible. Okay. The thing is, is that because there's so much of them there, I'm not from there. I can go visit the cheap piles and I'll find exactly what I'm looking for. Right. Now, 
If it's a store that I went to on a regular basis, after a while you know those piles. You pay more attention to the new arrivals. But general rule, you visit the new arrivals all the time. And they used stuff more than the new stuff, uh, than the new stuff also, because that's the stuff that they don't just order more copies of. That stuff, it's either there or it's not. Right? Um... So that's when it comes to the new arrivals. Okay, the other thing that I would say is you don't pay until the very end, right? So depending on how long you stay at a record store, what you do is collect your records. Okay, if you think that a record is a maybe, you don't know what's there, what's going to be there for the rest of your shopping there. So, for example, if you're there for an hour and a half, right? Pull them out. Pull them out. Keep them into your maybe pile. Go listen to them. Inspect them. From there, you know what your budget is, and you just trim down to the ones that you want the most, okay? But pull them out. Don't just leave them in the bin, because if you leave them in the bin and the next guy comes in and he pops it and he, he just grabs it, it's his record. You didn't, you didn't lay claim on it. You didn't lay claim on it. So he would happen to be right. So for me, pretty regularly, I'll show up with a stack like this and, you know, kind of trim down. Uh, to the nitty gritty, the ones that I want the most, and uh, I take the time to put those records away. Sometimes, depending on the record store, they'll say you don't have to worry about putting them away. Just put them in this pile over here, and we'll uh, sort them out for uh, for you. Other times, you know, it's just convenient, especially when it's a small shop. There's not, you know, there's just one employee. Do the courteous thing. Grab the records that you pulled out and just put them in their proper place. It's a, it's a nice etiquette to have. So that would be uh, another tip when it comes to the new arrivals. Never forget the new arrivals. Um, if you are so inclined and you really want to enjoy the experience, chat with the staff. Talk to the people there. Uh, any good record store understands that it's a cultural center. They're not selling you. Uh, they're not selling you anything. They're not selling you widgets. They understand that it's art. Okay, at least the good ones should. Okay, so you know, if a record store, for example, has a stage on it, right away you know you're you're going to the right record store because this record store is taking space to you know to create a performance space for artists. They understand the value of the art. They understand that the record store is a cultural center also so that's to say that the independent store is driven by the right thing it's driven by passion you got to make a living but it's still driven by the love of art um those places deserve all our support um chat with the staff the staff wants to talk about music uh, so you get into a conversation and if they can point you in the direction of something that's a great thing. It's happened to me many times where the shop owner pointed me to a record that I didn't know about. And uh, it's one of my favorites now. So the thing is, is also that um, if the shop owner really cares about your business, they'll kind of try to zone in on what you like and try to suggest the right thing and even go one step further and say, go listen to it at the listening station. All this is to say that there's a certain feel, there's a certain comfort that happens when you go to the right shops uh take advantage of that man a lot of the people back there aren't necessarily the music snobs that we see on black uh you know like jack black on uh, high fidelity some of them are and a lot of them are miserable i know i would be miserable i'd never own a shop because i'd kill everybody but uh some of them are really friendly and they have to be so uh suggestions always a good thing the other tip i would give you is Go, go crate digging with others. If you can, go with someone else, man. Not because, simply because the experience is better. I'll give you the perfect example. This has happened with, Diodato is the one that I keep coming up with because I've suggested a Diodato prelude record to two different people who went out and bought other Diodato records right after. This happened just recently in LA when we were going on our record crawl. We went to three different shops and I had some of this stuff. As a CTI guy, I know some of the, uh, you know, I, I know some of the titles. So a lot of the basic ones, Diodato is kind of like CA, CTI 101. I have these records. They're plentiful. Like I said, a couple of bucks each, they were everywhere. So I'm there with somebody else, Nelson. Hey, Nelson. I know you like hip hop. I know you you like samples. I know that you like jazz hip hop, like uh, Diggable Planets. Check this out. I don't know this, dude. It's two bucks. Check this out. Then I took a Stanley Turrentine record and I gave him a Stanley Turrentine record. 
Now, he owns five or six of each artist. It's fun to do that. It's fun to share music with others. It's fun to share art with other human beings, man. And if other people can hip you to something, it's what adds that story, okay? Again, vinyl isn't like Spotify. Vinyl isn't like... Um, vinyl is an experience, okay? And that experience includes history. Stories are part of that history. If you're able to attach a good memory to a record, that is the intangible. That is precisely the intangible that makes collecting music on vinyl what it is. Uh, so that interactive element is, I think, uh, the special sauce, you know? Guys, I think I've covered it all. I was under the impression that it might be longer. I may have not covered it all, though. Actually, another thing is, you know what? Just as a matter of etiquette, let's say the, I don't know, the uh, new arrivals bin is like this, right? And I'm on this end. I'm on this end over here, looking through the new arrivals. Don't be a dick and get right next to me. Start at the other end, courtesy. You know what I mean? It's like some people just kind of crowd your area. Listen, man, it's a contact sport. Elbows up. You're going to be rude. I'm going to slap you back. Um, and the other thing I would tell you definitely you shouldn't do, and this we're seeing a lot. You know how uh, I just said the Discog app, uh, Discogs app and just all of that information that you can get online is a very useful when you're shopping? That leads to douchebag behavior depending on the person if you're that guy that parks himself in a certain area and he opens up his fucking laptop or he opens up his smartphone and he just parks himself there so that nobody can touch that area and goes through all the records and starts looking for all the prices and it's all cool but you know what if you're disrupting everybody else and basically parking yourself you're a douche you're a douche and you shouldn't do that it's not polite it's not polite it is community space. It is not your personal office. And I think, I think, I think that's uh, my spiel. I don't even know. Should I be looking through these comments? I worry about the comments because sometimes they just go off for nothing. All right, folks, you know what? I'm going to stop right here. Uh, thanks. I hope you uh, like this type of um, broadcast. Uh, I'm going to get off right now and look at your comments and uh, play along with you. I wish I would have been able to do all of this live because I really like the interaction. Again, share your tips. Share the video if you enjoy the comment, if you, re if you enjoy the content. Uh, the subscriptions make a difference. Uh, and thanks, man. Thanks for everything. And thanks to Vinyl Me Please, who will be the sponsors of our prize. So rest assured, I might not name them all the time, but I name them and I see who does what. Uh, the support is appreciated and um, we're going to get a prize out to you, okay? Hope you guys had as much fun as I did. Peace.